Good evening, folks. Um, not sure how long this one's going to be. There's uh, some pretty straightforward uh, context here, but um, it might lead us into some interesting discussion. So uh, we're in Genesis chapter 13, and I'm, I'm probably only going to do one chapter tonight. I, I've got to go back to work tomorrow. Sigh. But i um, very excited. My wife is back. Hey, Michael. Welcome aboard. Uh, picked her up today in Nashville and uh, just uh, spent the day talking with her and um, all of that. Hey, Stephen. Welcome aboard. Um, so I got this nifty shirt that she got me. Uh, this one's cool. It's got like a, a, a paddle border down the back. I'd turn and show you, but I'd probably just hurt myself. Um, it was between this one or it was uh, another one she was going to get me. The shirts are uh, cloth, but they're dyed in the red clay that's found all over the island. And so it's this kind of natural dye that they have over there. I thought that was pretty cool. Hey, Trent. Welcome aboard. We're studying Genesis 13 tonight. So thank you, Stephen. I am too. Um, the other shirt she was going to get me, she was she asked me which one I wanted. Um, I said, uh, older than dirt. <laughs> So I'm not that old yet, uh, but it was pretty funny. So um, anyway, very glad she's back. But uh, like I said, we're only going to try to do one chapter tonight. So, uh, All right, Genesis chapter 1. Again, I'll be reading out of the King James, but I also have the ESV up just uh, for clarification. Um, and as I need it, um, the uh, Hebrew is also available to me um, for, uh, for reference. So... All right, let's get started then. Genesis chapter 13. And Abram went up out of Egypt, uh, he and his wife. Now remember, he was down there with Pharaoh, and he had told Pharaoh that uh, Sarai was his sister. Oh, that's right. We were going to talk about that real quick. Um, actually, it's in Genesis chapter 20, I believe, verse 12, that Abraham himself explains because he pulls this stunt a second time. Hi, Linda. We're uh, talking about uh, Genesis 13. But Abraham pulls this stunt again with Abimelech. And um, he actually he gets caught again saying, no, this is my sister. Uh, and he explains that Sarai is his, uh, is his sister in the sense that his, they have the same dad, but they don't have the same mother. So she's a half-sister. So it's explicitly sedated in Genesis chapter 20. Hey, Buck, Buck, welcome aboard. So, um, anyway, uh, now that that's out of the way, I wanted to uh, uh, continue on. He's coming up out of Egypt where he's been for a little while. And remember, uh, Pharaoh's blessed him. He's given him all of his cattle. And remember, Lot's with him during this time. Lot has been traveling with him the whole time. So Lot is kind of... Um, getting the same blessings that Abraham is getting because they're all kind of this big singular group. Um, so Abram went out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. So we go back to chapter 12. Remember he comes um, out of the land of his father and he makes an altar, and then he continues to travel, and then he ends up because of a famine in Egypt. Now he's coming back out of Egypt, and he's going back to the place where he's made this altar. Um, so verse 4, unto the place of the altar, which he uh, had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of, of Jehovah. So again, he's, he's worshiping God. Um, he is, uh, we talk about calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, it's a very important phrase because uh, in the New Testament it has a very specific meaning. Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, um, the idea of calling on the name of the Lord is obeying God and his specific commands. Uh, in Acts twenty two sixteen, 16, uh, Paul, Saul, is recounting his conversion account. <clears throat> and he says that... Uh, uh, when, when Ananias uh, came to him after three days where he couldn't see and he was fasting, Ananias says, you know, why are you tearing your eyes now and be immersed calling on the name of the Lord? So the idea here was that following the specific command of God to be immersed for the remission of sins. Here, 
Abram is, remember, he's coming out of a land where they have all these pagan gods, all these fake gods and stuff, but he's actually uh, given up those gods, and now he's worshiping only Jehovah. He's only doing what Jehovah is commanding him to do. So he's, he's come back to this altar, and he's going to he's gonna worship God. <clears throat> uh, Arthur's here, and Megan is here. Wow, lots of people coming on tonight. Thanks for joining us, guys. We're in Genesis 13, and we are now in verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. So you have these nomadic people who are basically roving city-states by this time. They have huge families. They have huge um, uh, groups of people. Um, uh, of course, we know that Lot had two daughters, and we know that Abram doesn't have any children yet, but uh, they have all of these these servants that are with them, all of these uh, flocks and all of these possessions, and, and it's just this mass moving through the land, and you can kind of think of it almost like locusts. They're consuming everything wherever they go, and so much that the land just isn't able to hold them both um, because God had blessed them so much. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So there's there's these descendants of Ham that are still in this area. And remember Noah's curse that they would be servants of uh, the descendants of Shem uh, and of Japheth. And so uh, uh, Abram said unto Lot, verse 8, Let there be no strife, I pray thee between me and thee, and between my herdmen and, and your herdmen, for we are brethren. Um, the idea there is they're kinsmen, uh, not that they're brothers, which is clear from the context already. And <clears throat> Abram says in verse 9, Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I pray you, from me. If you will take the left hand, then I will go to the right, or if you depart to the right, I will go to the left. Uh, it's very kind of Abraham. This kind of shows us a little bit about what, what kind of man Abraham was already here at the beginning. Um, he puts his faith in, in Jehovah. He immediately does everything that, that God asked him to do. And then here he's very kind and he gives his nephew the first choice of the land. Verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and behold, beheld all the plain of Jordan, and that it was well watered everywhere before Jehovah destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah even as the garden of Jehovah, like the land of Egypt, as you come unto Zoar. So, <clears throat> Lot looks up after this and sees all of this well-watered land, great for his, his herds, his, his cattle and his sheep, uh, and sees that it's wonderful um, compared to the garden of Jehovah, probably the garden of Eden is what's, what's in mind here, like the land of Egypt along the Nile River, um, so, uh, you have this wonderful, wonderful land, but again, Lot is choosing the best, not necessarily wrong to do that, but we know that his mind is on things physical where Abraham is on, um, the, the idea of, uh, the relationships in, in doing what is right. Um, <clears throat> so verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before Jehovah exceedingly. Now, I don't know if Lot knows this at the time. Um, it is likely that he has some indication because they've passed through this land before um, but, uh, Lot is going to go down into this despite what these men are like, and we can't really read into the text, try to understand what Lot was thinking. We can only read what, what Moses is writing here. So, um, hmm, you're going to be quoting Hebrews there, Stephen. We might have to have a separate discussion about that, um, that heavenly city that Abraham desired. 
Yeah, no, but I get what you're saying. Your point is is that Abraham was was definitely thinking about spiritual things, whereas Lot was thinking physical. I totally agree with that. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll talk about that because um, that gets into eschatology there with with uh, uh, the quote that you're going for out of Hebrews. So uh, I believe that's uh, Hebrews eleven, if I'm not mistaken. All right, verse fourteen. And Jehovah said unto Abraham, Abram. After that lot was separated from him, lift up your eyes uh, now and look from the place where you are, north and south and east and west. For all the land that you see, to you will I give it and to your seed forever. Man, <laughs> Man forever. That's a powerful word there, right? So when we read that word today, we think that uh, forever we, we just continue on and on and on. It's an unending linear time. And so uh, as long as the earth is going to, the planet's going to be here, Israel's supposed to have that land. Well, then God lied, essentially. Because there are two times that Israel has lost that land. If God had promised it to them forever in the way that we kind of think of it today, then God... God lied to Abraham here because the Israelites have not kept that land forever. Uh, in fact, it wasn't restored to them until what ni- was it 1938, I believe, or 1948. I can't remember which of those decades it was, but um, <clears throat> the idea is is that they lost their land for centuries, and it was finally restored to them by a bunch of people who are were essentially millennialists, and uh, America was spearheading that. Because a lot of the people uh, during that time uh, in America believed that Israel was was still the, the chosen ones, the, the people of promise or, or whatever. And America wanted to be on the good side because they all thought Jesus was coming back pretty soon. And so <clears throat> if forever in this context means until time ends, then God is a liar. So, yeah, 48, that's what it is. Sorry, it's late and I'm a little flustered right now. Um, So, if instead we read the word forever to mean for the entire allotted time, or uh, what we would say the duration of the covenant itself, then uh, when Abram is given this land and his descendants are given this land, that they would be given this land by the promise of God, for as long as the covenant would last. Well, what was the covenant? The covenant was not land. The covenant was that all the nations of the world would be blessed through his descendants, through his seed. And we know that that's Christ. So the Israelites would get to keep this land at least partially in their possession because we know about the dividing of the kingdom and stuff. But we know that they would get to stay in this land at least until... God fulfilled his promise to Abram, to Abraham. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, we so need to, I mean, not, I don't necessarily see the Israelis as, as a, as a bad nation. You know, they, they are a, a republic like we are. Um, I, I guess as far as I know, foreign policy, they're a, a fair ally in a region that is nothing but a hotbed of Islamic activity. Um, so in that sense, sure. But as far as, as saying, you know, we need to protect them because the Bible, that's, that's just not in there. And that's not anti-Semitic. It's just understanding what the Bible says. I don't have anything against them. I'm not, I don't have any enmity towards them. Um, but they're not God's people anymore. They stopped being God's people at the cross. So, but anyway, this idea of, of uh, God giving them the seed forever, the God is giving them the seed, uh, this idea is uh, for the time allotted of the covenant. The, the entire time is what that means. And it's over and over and over again. We're going to see this word forever uh, used throughout the Old Testament. And it always means for a specific duration based on the context of what's being said. It does not ever mean um, in, in any relationship to Old Testament things for the entirety of time. 
until the earth passes away. Now, we do know that Jesus was given a kingdom forever. Mm -hmm. But even that is only until the end of time. Jesus is, is going to deliver that kingdom up, uh, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 24, back to the Father. He's going to abdicate his power, uh, his throne to the Father um, at the end of time. So even that will have an end to it. But um, this idea of forever, it's kind of like, a, you know, the, the kid in the backseat of the car. I was, I was going to uh, the airport today to pick up my wife. And um, my, my youngest says, are we there yet? How much longer? This is taking forever. Well, she didn't really mean this is taking until the end of time. That's not what the phrase means. So... Um, anyway, we'll highlight that and point it out as we continue on. But Israel is, is no longer God's chosen people. We know that throughout the New Testament. Paul over and over and over again hits that point. Uh, we can see here another bit of hyperbole. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall your seed also be numbered. Did God really make Abram... It's it's into the like septillions. Um, if you get into counting the number, like you, uh, if you count the uh, the number of air molecules in a a quarter or a, a centimeter squared, the the number is um, something like nine followed by eighteen zeros. It's 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 a stupid amount of of molecules in a, a square centimeter. So if we're talking about all the grains of sand. Even if we limit this word earth here to the Adama rather than the Eretz. And let me just look that up real quick. So we're at verse 16 here. The dust of the earth. So, nope, that's Eretz. So that's the larger, that's the larger idea here. Um, <clears throat> if if Abram was really going to have descendants that would number as the dust of the earth, and we're talking physical descendants, then, again, God lied. So there's two other options here. Either God is speaking in terms of hyperbole, because he does say, if a man can number the dust of the earth, which no man really can to any uh, precise degree, uh, we only estimate, um, or God is talking about descendants that are not physical descendants but instead are spiritual descendants because we know that in places like Romans where it talks about how uh, those who are, uh, uh, they, they have an obedient faith towards Jehovah, they are the descendants of Abraham, not the physical Israel. And so uh, I actually tend towards that latter one. Uh, I tend towards the idea that, that God is going to fulfill the promise to Abraham uh, with the spiritual seed, but he's going to bless in in terms of the land, the physical land promise. Um, he's speaking, I, I believe, in, in hyperbole. So um, you can pick whichever way you want to go with that, uh, but it, it, it cannot be a literal uh, physical blessing of, you know, Abraham, all of your physical descendants are going to number as the, the whole planet couldn't hold that many people. There's, there's no way, certainly not this promised land. It's an absurd promise if you take, try to take it literally. Um, yes, exactly so. Romans 9, 8. Thank you, Stephen. That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> and I think really that's the whole point of the book of Romans is a contrast between physical Israel and, and the, the Gentiles uh, and what their blessings are outside of the church you know, what was their importance outside of the church? And then how, how are they, uh, how do they coexist within the church? And in the church, there is no distinction between them. Um, the Jews were considered broken off of the tree, um, the tree being God's family, the, the natural branches, the individual natural branches were the individual Jews um, that had grown out of it uh, in this metaphor of a tree. Um, but then you had the Christians that were grafted in, the Gentiles that were grafted in, and even the Jews could be grafted back in, which represents that, that uh, adoption 
uh, or that um, uh, obedience to the gospel. So uh, uh, anyway, the, the idea is that throughout Romans, physical Israel doesn't matter anymore. They, they, they don't matter. There is no such thing. Paul fought his entire uh, apostleship against the Judaizers trying to say that, you know, um, we should go back and be circumcised. We can go back and, and follow the law of Moses. And Paul says over and over and over again, no, to do that's to fall from grace. So, uh, let's see here. Brian says we will, oops, uh, we will disagree here. Also, God does not renege on his promises. No, he doesn't. I agree with that. Our time would run out too under your system. How then is Israel called back from all the corners of the earth to inherit the lands? They're called back within the church, and it isn't. Uh, you're 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 putting a whole bunch of things together, Brian. Um, uh, how does uh, how does Ephraim come back? How does the northern tribes come back? They were completely eradicated. They were spread out. Uh, there is no more northern tribes. They do not exist. They don't exist today um, in any sense of the word that, that, that you could conceive of. But their descendants who interbred with all of the Gentile nations during their captivity uh, under Assyria, they have a part in the church and as Stephen said, it's the new heavens and the earth, new earth. So let me finish up here, and then uh, maybe we can dis discuss this off off uh, time. So it says, Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And then Abraham removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto Jehovah. So we'll talk more about Abram and the land. Some interesting things are about to happen Um some cool stuff that we don't really talk about in Bible class, but um, anyway, uh, Brian, I'll I'll probably mention some of this stuff. Um, I my little one is calling me again, so I got to wrap up tonight. But uh, I'm not trying to dismiss you or just trying to brush it off. I definitely want I will definitely want to talk about it. So maybe maybe we'll take a break next time and come back and, and talk about it. Um, but thank you all for for being with me tonight, even though it was a little bit of a, a crazy night and. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you guys tomorrow.